There's something so gratifying about chopping firewood. It's something I have to be honest, I have very little experience with. Hey folks, today we're going to do a two year review of the work I've done on our homestead here. As we record this, it is September 4th. We purchased this property 2020 September 4th, or we, we took possession of it then. So it's been two years here. We're gonna do a full tour, walking around, showing you all the infrastructure, all the things that we've built, the gardens, the greenhouses, the power system, every, everything. It's gonna be a long video. We'll probably splice it up into segments as well. To start, I purchased this property, it was uh, August 2020. We took possession of it September 4th, 2020. Now, when we took possession of this property, we didn't really do much because we came in the fall and you know, we went into winter about a month and a half into that. And so not really much happened in that first half year. It was April, early April of 2021 where we really started work. So we've really only had, call it a year and a half to do work on here. And, and in the winters of each year, we didn't really do that much. Um, but we'll go kind of go through and talk about every little bit. Now, what I wanted to say to start is when we bought this place, there was nothing here. We have a small cabin that we live in and that's the only thing that was here. There was some basic infrastructure tied to that cabin. There was a very tiny off-grid system with um, three panels, three solar panels, and a two windmills that are effectively useless in my opinion, <laughs> but they, they do work. Um, they're, no, they're no longer tied into our main power system, and we'll talk about the power system when we go and look at that. But when we came here, this was just raw ground. You know, some places I've left somewhat natural. Over to the right here, um, you can kind of see there's, it's just this natural grass. That's mostly what was here. That's all that was here when we came. None of these roads were here. There was little paths along where I've made these roads, but this was just wild ground. So we've done a ton of work on it. So we might as well, um, actually no, before we'll talk about the gardens, I'll just talk about some of the basic infrastructure that happened. So two things that we did on this property that you can't really see much of, especially from where we're standing right now, um, that, that have taken a lot of time and resources was making the driveway better. And my driveway is already challenging as it is. I've probably spent 30 or 40 grand on it. And uh, it's a kilometer long and it, and it zigzags with four switchbacks to get up to the mountain ridge that we're on here. We've put a ton of time and money into that to make it better. And I could easily spend another $100,000 on that driveway. It seems to be endless. So that's something that we've put a lot of time and money and resources into. Another thing that's a critical piece of infrastructure that you never really see in the videos, you might see the odd time in the vlogs, is the fence. So when we got this property, I, I knew that I wanted to build a big fence. The main reason being is we have young children and we have gardens and some livestock animals, and this is wild country. The first year that we were here, so we took possession in September of 2020, we spent a winter here and uh, we had a spring and the fence wasn't really finished until August. In that time, we had over 20 bear incidents you know, nothing, nothing dangerous, but bears coming in, smashing up the compost, knocking things over, tearing up uh, garbage bins, uh, trying to break into the watershed, all kinds of crazy experiences. And so I knew out of the gate that that was gonna be an issue. So we put in the time and the money to build a fence. And so surrounding all the open area that we're in here, you can't see any of it from where we stand, there's a fence that's 2,400 linear feet. It's, it's uh, eight feet high, high tensile. We also have two electric wires on it. That surrounds our primary area, which, in, which encompasses eight acres. So our whole property is 40 acres, and the fence encompasses and surrounds the uh, 
primary eight acres where we live, where the gardens are, where pretty much 99% of the activity that we do on this homestead is in that, in that fenced area. And uh, it was certainly worth it because we haven't had any bear incidents. I don't have any deer coming in and eating the gardens. It's, uh, it's, been, it's been really good. It's been really nice peace of mind too with the kids. So those are those two things there. And when we looked at the property, when we, when we kind of, when I was visioning how I was gonna do this, you know, we're, off, we're totally off grid. We're in a very rural area, super, super low population density. From where we stand, we can only see one neighbor and we can just see a field of his property. We can't see their house or anything. So we have a lot of privacy up here. But when, we, uh, when I was first coming up with the vision for this property, I really looked at the four nexuses of human survival, which is food, water, energy, and shelter. And so I wanted to take as many of those weak links out as early as possible. Let's start with, uh, actually, I'll, I'll talk about food, water, energy, and shelter in a, in a different order. I'll start with shelter. So we had a place to live. So our, our vision was to, is to build a home that we want to live in for the rest of our lives and have our children grow up in. And that's a big project. Building a house is, uh, it takes a lot of money, a lot of time, and a lot of work. We had a house to live because there is this cabin up here that we've actually put a little bit of work into to make it comfortable for us to live in. We haven't really done much to it, the way it looks or anything like that, but we've made it comfortable for us to live in. So we had shelter. And the next thing that I wanted to accomplish was energy because we needed energy up here. We're, we're off grid. We, it, we can't really economically get power up here. Uh, it would actually probably cost about the same as the off grid system. So I wanted to have power because once I had power, then I could start pumping water, which then I can use for food. Um, and we needed that power to do construction up here, to charge tools and you know, run the greenhouse fans and, and all kinds of stuff in that. We needed more power. Plus, the original power system that came with this cabin was not suitable for a family of four. Not, not at all, especially during the winter, like not, not even close. You'd have to run a generator almost every single day throughout the winter. And so that was the second thing we did was we, we hit the power. So we'll go look at that uh, afterwards, but I'm just gonna kind of overview everything here. So we hit, did the power, got that operational. Then the next thing we did was the water because I can't really grow food without water. So there was a small well on this property that didn't work. I thought it was going to, but it, it didn't. And there is a small water system that's a, basically a snow melt and rainwater catchment system that's here. And it's actually a really neat system. We can look at that on this tour as well. Um, it, I haven't done anything to it. It's basically, there's a shed built on a foundation that's a cistern. It's eight feet deep. Uh, it's about 16 feet long. I think it's 10 feet wide. It, it holds 40,000 liters of water. So that system was there when we got here, which was great. But again, it wasn't enough to do gardens for sure. And it wasn't enough to take showers even every second day for a family of four, not even close. So once we had the power system, we went and we drilled another well. And we hit gold on that well. And it's, it's really neat about water. I'll talk about it more as we walk around. But um, we did get, we drilled down 375 feet on top of a mountain and we got 10 gallons a minute and it's fantastic, and it seems like we're tapped into some kind of underground aquifer. I haven't been able to make even a dent in the water. I can pretty much pump it all day, every day, and there's a lot of water. So once we had the water set up, it was really this year that I started the gardens. Last year in 2021, we were just doing infrastructure things so that I could have a base that we could move from. And so we built a greenhouse before we built the house, um, because, like I said, we already had a place to live that was comfortable enough that we figured, okay, we can live in here for two years, no problem. Our kids are still small. They're three and five. And um, it really made it, you know, we could just come here and settle in. We've sold our home in Kelowna, so we're out of there entirely now, and we're just up here. In the first year, in 2021, we, we didn't actually, it, it took us from the time we bought this place, uh, took possession of it in September of 2020, 2020, we didn't sell our house until September of 2021. So we were actually, the first year we were here, we were commuting back and forth to Kelowna a lot. And it was a lot of driving and it was really exhausting. But 
uh, September 21, we fully moved up here. And so we've really only been here full time for a year. But um, so before I, you know, we started on the house, we can look at that a little bit in this video, but I built my garage and greenhouse first because I wanted to have infrastructure that would allow us to grow food. And again, food, water, energy, and shelter. We wanted to have all of those things in place so that we're independent mostly. And then we can be, next year, we're gonna pick up building the house again. We're a lot more comfortable. We've got all of our food systems, energy and water all in place. And again, a comfortable place to live. So that's kind of what it is in a nutshell. Now let's go around and look at each thing that we've done. Well, let's just start right where I am in the gardens here. This is the first terrace that we constructed. Now, we're on a mountain. My biggest challenges up here are rock and access, really. Um, there's been some other challenges too, exposure to weather and whatnot, and it is a little bit colder because we're on a mountain. But everything that we, every place we grow or live on here, we've had to construct. I've, I, I went and bought two machines to do this, so you know this isn't for everybody. But I've always had this dream about living on a mountain. And so um, everything that we're going to look at for gardens, has the ground has had to been constructed because there was parts of this that were kind of flat in some spaces, but we had to terrace all this. So this where I'm standing right here is the biggest terrace. This is a kind of a long finger that goes out. It's about, it's about 3,000 square feet total. And this is the first one we built. And this, this plot here has 14, uh, uh, 18 foot beds, 30 inch wide, traditional market garden style. This was the first one I did, and this is the first plot that I planted in the spring. I'm, I've got an onion crop here that we'll be harvesting in the next month. We've got some leeks, some carrots, more carrots, potatoes that we're harvesting now. And we had beans and pea, uh, peas and beans on these trellises. Some of these beans are still going. But uh, this is what we started with. And um, this was a ton of work because not only did I have to shape this with machinery, but I had to bring material in, rocky material on the low side to stabilize the terrace and then bring in subsoil and then topsoil and then ultimately mulch. So a lot of work has gone into all of these terraces. But they're, they're working great. Uh, we've put drainage around all of these terraces. That's one thing. I've done separate videos on that. But every time I have a, a big terrace, if it's in any direction of water coming down, I drain around it. The main reason for that is so that we don't have a constant erosion flow that would be pushing the terrace downhill. Because soil always makes its way downhill. And so all the best you can do is really slow it down. And so that's what we've done. This is all perfectly leveled. And we have a lot of water in the snow melt and the springtime in the fall that will come down here and it'll hit this and it'll move all the way around and then drain down towards my orchard or the, the first part of my orchard, which we'll go look at shortly as well. But um, so we come through here, um, all of these terraces, all of my gardens are a dual irrigation. So it's a drip and overhead. And the overhead might change from, from uh, plot to plot. And I still have two more of these terraces to build next season until this garden is complete as far as the annual production is concerned. But so on this one in particular, we've got a drip irrigation on each bed. And then we've got overhead. And in this case, we have three different impact heads that run on two different uh, circuits, if you will, not zones. They're just circuits on the zone, which I can turn on or off. So I can either run drip or I can run overhead. And I've talked a lot about that in the past and, and I'll probably do more videos on it in the future, but that's essentially how we irrigate all of this. We'll also, in this video, go and look at the centralized irrigation system here and how this is all put together. So coming down here, when I first constructed this terrace, I had to bring machinery down this path and machines will no longer come down here. So I've kind of made this nebulous area into a strawberry patch, which I just replanted in the summer. So this is all new. It's still kind of weedy, not really much going on there. Uh, next season, it'll be all full of strawberries. And so I've taken this access point offline. It's now just foot traffic and, and tools, basically. 
and it gets us down to the second part of this terrace. It steps down about four feet here. It's all part of this same finger, but the ground elevation drops down. And here we've got a small section of beds here. I've got some fall cabbage planted and we go into this high tunnel, which we're going to seal up in the next week or so, but I've kept it open-ended just for ease of ventilation because it's, it, it's been a, quite a hot summer, though a short summer, but it's, it's been quite hot. So that's made it nice and easy for us. But this, this terrace stretches out quite a bit. This greenhouse is 40 feet long. It's 16 feet wide. And um, in it, I've got fall crops. This is all brassicas, carrots, beets, some spinach. This is the cool crops that we'll be picking off to eat all winter long. And uh, hopefully my cabbage makes it. I've actually struggled with some pest pressure on these, but we've seemed to have got it under control. We had, we had some brutal grasshoppers at first that, that took a big chunk. We put nets over, that got the grasshoppers off, and then we had some uh, cabbage moth that laid larva and the little caterpillars just went to town on the cabbage. So some of it's struggling a bit. Hopefully we get something from it this season. It's a lot of trial and error. When you're on a first piece of land, you really got to figure out the, the kind of nuances of that land and what, what that soil will do for you. So we're still kind of figuring that out. And just behind this greenhouse, there's another little block of beds. We don't need to go over there, but I've got six beds that are 16 feet long back there. I've got a, uh, that was my second potato planting and that's all doing well. We'll be harvesting those before the end of this month. And that's what this terrace looks like. I mean, just right above me, we don't even need to go here. We can look at this other terrace and up there I've got, I think it's eight different beds of various different sizes and I've got corn up there, which I hope makes it. I'm starting to see the cobs form out. I've got pickling cukes, I've got some asparagus and there's a small bed of zucchinis up there as well. So that's another terrace. I have two more terraces to construct next season. The top one, the trusses and floor joists for the house are on, so that one won't be finished until those are used on the house. So that might be, you know, springtime or summertime next year, and then we'll have all this planted out. Once this is all done, we'll have about half an acre of total square footage of annual production. And when I say to total square footage, what I mean is, the block of a beds of, of a series of beds so right here we've got three beds wide it's nine feet by 16 feet i would take that and call that total square footage including the walkway and so we'll have about a half an acre of annual vegetable production once once everything is shaped out Check out my site from thefield.tv. It's where I post all my vlogs and the vast majority of all my content. All right, guys, we'll see you in the next one.